a short story written by Gwyneth Harold Davidson called The Night Nothing Happened. It is six o'clock and the celestial beams are giving way to pinheads of light trickling up from the plains to the summits. This is twilight at six miles, the eastern gateway of the city. It rained earlier, leaving the streets glistening with life-giving water and the air soft with its vapor. Neither the sun nor the rain warn, neither do they guard. The New Haven Church is a welcoming committee, a concrete hill with a peak of green shingles. It is the first in a mountain range that fringes Kingston, a broken ring of sentinels permanently off duty. The road rises slightly, a small hump, the city's rump, followed by a tail brilliant with corpuscles of moving light. The contrabus puffing ahead of Curtis was loaded with delicate skin tomatoes. Beside him in the downtown lane, the bass speakers in a minibus swelled with the plaintive acoustic guitar and long harmonies of the popular song of the past few weeks. Curtis yearned to reach a turnoff onto Perkins Boulevard. Although he bathed after work, his skin did not escape the fine red dirt that dusted the hairs on his forearms, hairs and eyelashes. He was heading home from the bauxite mines. The windows of his pickup were already tightly sealed, so he turned up the radio a few notches higher. He could not insulate his own heart's rhythm from the strain of strings from the vehicle beside him. But if he turned up his radio, he could at least listen to the news. They should never have recorded that song, much less broadcast it, he mumbled through gritted teeth as a soloist crooned, I can be a better man. Ahead, the white bulk of a stricken bus loomed and Curtis saw that it was blocking the road. Perhaps the driver had been speeding and saw a tire tearing pothole too late. Curtis decided to take a gamble and detoured onto Baldwin Crescent. He was that tired. Curtis did not like going through Baldwin Crescent. The pastel painted matchbox apartments in the bend harbored criminals, gunmen and drug dealers and bandits who made extra money by robbing unwise motorists who came through their area after dark. Curtis focused on the road, so did not notice the slightly disinterested stare from bank manager, whose girlfriend, Karen, was combing his hair on the sidewalk. On at least two corners, domino games were in session, punctuating loose groups of youth sitting around on fences or leaning on the buildings. The street was a living room because the houses were too small and cramped for comfort in the humid tropical heat. Bank manager admired Curtis' pickup. It would yield good parts, he thought, as Karen pulled gently on a knot. His cell phone rang. It was Priest. What a man I say, bank manager greeted him with respect. You want to say that through a yard memorial, we are keep one peace dance round black hands later. The man can pass through with the eye crew. Everything Chris, you don't know. What bank manager knew was that if a crew from Baldwin reached Black Ants, the memorial could no longer be a laid, black, laid back flex. Too many persons would be nervous and maybe draw forward long memories that would ignite short fuses. Bank manager remained casual. So good man, yeah man, we will see. Cool, no? Then rang off. The aroma of seasoned tinned corned beef stirred up with macaroni elbows carried a melody from the apartment behind him, and he shouted to Karen's mother, Turn up the radio. Let me hear my boy. The soloist's voice soon filled the community, his mournful voice declaring that he could be a better man. Karen locked her eyes shut and rocked back her head to join in the chorus. Bank manager rubbed one of Karen's legs, bare beneath her loincloth of a jean skirt. They had done good work that week, 
So Karen's mother had walked to put pot on fire tonight, and everybody in their crew would eat good. Then later, some more domino would play, and he would order beer and stout by the crates from the bar up the road. Curtis was offering a silent prayer willing the slow moving traffic to accelerate so he could get out of the corner before any incident. Bank manager was relaxed. He wasn't going to take up priest's offer. Baldwin Crescent did not need to work tonight. They would stay on the street, eat food, beat juice, listen to music, play games and chat with each other. Nothing was going to happen to them tonight. In the radio studio, Anna Riddim put her lips close to the microphone and her trademark voice rolled out like logwood honey. That's how we pass the baton this evening to the musical pleaser, Buck, who will get your weekend party started right. I will be back with you on Monday afternoon, all being well. Until then, make sure and hug your children tight and keep your loved ones close. She was already groping for a cigarette before she left the studio and lit up right outside the front door, drawing a deep breath on the short walk to her car. She didn't notice a receptionist telling her goodbye or see the car washer as he beckoned to her from across the parking lot. She owed him for the week, but her mind was focused on one thought. How she would get the girl. Anna considered that if she drove to her manicurist, did an hour, then went to the girl's apartment, she would catch her at home. Anna would take the screwdriver out of her tool bag in the boot and scratch the words, left me husband, on the bonnet. She was that sick and tired of their carryings on and decided to retaliate at a higher level because the protracted bickering in the house was only increasing her headaches. Anna did not mind that the man thief was a licensed firearm holder who had actually dropped licks on Anna's husband once when they had a disagreement. That whole story did boss when he faltered during his explanation to Anna about how he came to have a split lip. Anna helped him to fabricate the publicly released story that he slipped on the bathtub in the bathtub and hit the soap holder on his way down. Anna did not care for any more of these incidents. She found them distasteful and embarrassing and a poor use of her emotional energy. She looked in her handbag as she groped for her car keys and finding them saw the eyes of her children looking up at her through the protective clear acrylic casing. They were standing where the soft foam lapped the beach of Lime Key. Anna's husband had embalmed that golden moment of Eunice and Eugenie. The photo came out so nice that it was sent to all of the grandparents and godparents, was in pride of place on the living room coffee table and here on Anna's key ring. In that little plastic case, their images were protected and her plan this evening was about protecting the future of their family. Anna took another draw of her cigarette for courage, slid behind the steering wheel, and saw that the anxious car washer was at the windshield waving. You forget me, Miss Anna? In the studio, Buck regretted the fuss that he left at home. He had shouted, his son had shouted, his wife shouted back at the both of them to shut up because it was waking the baby, which was a waste because the baby was already wailing. Buck did not like quarreling with his son on their weekends together, and this one had started all wrong. Daddy, how you can say that? I ever scratch the car? I ever break it, trust and bring it back late? How you expect me to feel that my father come pick me up after a party? You going to drop home all of my friends too? Buck said yes to the last question. His son kissed his teeth. You know, I could understand if it was mummy, cause she just nervous. But you, daddy, should know better than that. Buck had zoned out. He knew that it was a wrong thing to do on this serious topic, but he had seen enough of Heineken drinking parties to know that he needed to fret for his son on the road. It was not that he did not trust his son to make the right decisions, but the slick 
marketing tactics of those events made it too easy to overcome good intentions and consume alcohol all night. Then, somewhere between 3 and 5 in the morning, buzzed out youngsters would get behind the wheel and play a lethal game of lucky poker. Pick one and you made it home. Pick two, you did not. Pick three and that made for an interesting story. Buck decided that if he had anything to do with it, no high stakes would play tonight. Out of spite, Buck's son decided not to even leave his room for the rest of his stay. He wanted nothing to dilute the pure anger he was distilling inside of his gut. He did not miss the television or his iPod, or even that there wasn't a radio in the room. His stepmother knocked him to in invite him to dinner, but he did not answer, using each knock on the door as a measure to intensify his rage by tones and shades. The coming of twilight and gradual darkening of the room created the perfect cocoon within which to isolate himself and nurture thoughts of revenge. Then he heard his cell phone ring from a distance. He knew that it was his because the ringtone was a hook of the popular song, True Reflections. Ray jackknifed in the bed, his own nerves tingling as he realized that his telephone was not with him in the room. Each note of the ringtone presented the face of someone that he wanted to speak with and who might be trying to reach him to plan for this important night. The phone stopped ringing and he waited for the house phone to ring. None of his father's friends had his father's house number. And if it was his mother, then she would call the landline right away. But that phone was silent. Reflections chimed again and Ray's agitation grew as he wondered, which friend? He practically levitated from the bed and swung the door open with such force that it hit the wall while he let his memory rather than his ears lead him to the den. That was where he left the phone after he stalked out after his quarrel with his father. It was neither there nor in the foyer. Ray felt his panic reach his bowels as he dreaded the moment when the phone would stop ringing again. He focused all his senses on geographically positioning its location to the kitchen. Where's my phone? His stepmother put the house phone receiver back in its cradle and he saw that his mobile was in her other hand. With one deft movement, she scooped up his little brother and before he knew it, the baby was in his arms. Look, Stewie, she crooned. Ray is here now. Ray, I'm so glad you came out. You have to help me because you're the only person that he's going to smile for tonight. Ray's mother, Totty, was happy to have him out of her care that day. It was the party event of the generation, and she had her hands full getting all the groups under her sea mobilized to depart from their districts, homes and rum bars, and travel the next morning to the National Arena for a full day of activities. Everything was in place, and here at Central Control, a team of about 10 women were making round the island calls to all groups, confirming numbers and seeing that there were enough bus seats and meals available. Totty raked her lips with her teeth and sensing the living blood and tissue beneath. The figures kept going up, proof of her superlative organizational skills. The door opened and the General Secretary Emeritus GSE walked into the room. A tall man approaching 80 years, whose most outstanding features were his straight back and expertly groomed jet black hair and beard. All is well, I see. She assumed a modest pose. We're working, sir. Your team is doing a fine job. Reminds me of back at Independence when everybody was really keyed up. Great energy. Totty beamed, and the GSE scored a mental point for engaging her attention. She even added, And we're going to take it to a higher level, sir, if I may use a young people's slang. Oh, we're going to have a motorcade. Her beam could not have been brighter, 
and he smiled, seemingly approving. Starting with this evening, sir, we are tracking every bus from the south to meet out by Big Tree by the Old Harbor Roundabout, and the buses from the north will reconnoiter by Mullines Road. When we get a mass of about 20 to 30 vehicles, they will move on, banners waving, music playing, along a carefully mapped route. The people will see that we are fit and ready. The GSE nodded falsely, not letting his demeanor betray his feelings. He had heard about the planned motorcade, and dismantling those plans was the sole reason for this visit. Fifty years ago, as a young Turk who helped to muscle out the old order and bring in a modern political movement, he helped to create the party's pomp and ceremony, including the motorcade. He had joined the first few himself, and as admiral of the fleet, enjoyed the festive atmosphere and the camaraderie of cars on the move. Five years later, when playful taunts turned to bigoted jeering, he was disappointed. When the first bus that was diverted from a set route was stoned in the 1970s, he was alarmed. When weeks of intercommunal tension and violence became the predictable wake of a motorcade in the 80s, he began to seriously doubt their usefulness. When the communities removed drain covers and drew refrigerators across roads in anticipation of a motorcade in the 90s, he knew that they needed to be banned. As she looked at her visitor, Totty wondered why was the GSE referred to as the General Ginnell by party members in very senior positions. He was nodding and smiling like a dapper Father Christmas, bestowing gifts of approval and support to her. She found his steady gaze and benign smile a therapeutic break and found herself describing how well her system was working and how inclusive it would be for all of the interest groups that the party wanted to engage. The tinkle of a ringtone caused him to look at her with apologetic eyes and reach into his pocket and pull out a cell phone and answer it. Ex excuse me, Miss Totling. Hello. Ah, Don, how are you? I hear that a little firm is breaking good ground for, what is it? a collaborative headquarters for your Latin, your Central American IT group. Good, good. Totti's eyes flashed to the GSEs and found that he was waiting for her gaze and he held it, laughing at some private joke between himself and his caller. Yes, tomorrow is a big day for us, you know, going into an election period and so on. Yes, your people should see us on the road. We're going through that area, I believe. He now turned slightly away from Totty, lowered his voice, but kept it audible. It is something that our people really look forward to, a harmless part of the conference, and we get all the necessary permits and security support. His voice went down a notch lower. Totty found herself leaning towards him while her eyes were fixed on a page in her notebook. Yes, yes. The boulevard was an unfortunate situation. I promise you, that won't happen on Riddles Road. We have everything under control. Our ground organizer, Miss Totlin, is hiring only the most responsible drivers. And we want no hangers-on on our platform. Totty felt her stomach leap. One of the largest financiers in the country was concerned that her motorcade would be driving past his work site that was located in an opposition stronghold. The site was bound to be a big employer of unskilled laborers for the area who would take a passing vehicle with party colors as a sign of serious provocation and might already be preparing for the invasion. The vision she had of her parade a few minutes ago now seemed malignant from the point of view of someone who was a key source of funding her own telephone rang and she silenced it. I don't know what you're asking us to do, Don. It's our right. The GSC was now gently protesting. Then he hung up the phone with what seemed to be a whimper and gave Totty the full view of his concerned demeanor, lips pursed, brow slightly knitted, 
Then, like the sun dancing on water, he projected a beam of total relaxation. <laughs> My apologies, Miss Totlin. Businessmen seem to think they can dictate to us as they have a mind. Your plans seem wonderful, and I'm sure that they will be executed admirably, and we won't have any problems at all. You heard me defend it. Totty was stunned. Sir, we can't risk anything happening in that area. The political fallout will be massive. The money that he is putting into that project is one of our achievements for inner city development and divestment. The general secretary said nothing and kept his face neutral, willing her to finish her thought audibly. I am calling off the motorcade. But you have everything in place. It is still too risky. I'm going to send out an order that the vehicles travel singly or in pairs and to stay on the highways and avoid all the hot areas. We can have a mass rally in the stadium parking lot. She called to her workers and barked instructions for them to call various group leaders and give out the new directives. I'll leave it to you then, the GSE said mournfully and left the room thinking how a small gadget with an alarm function allowed one man to do so much work. In the past, he would have needed a carefully selected factotum on hand. Totty checked her telephone to see whose call she had missed. It was her friend, Anna. She called her back. Hi, Anna. Can you talk? Yeah. I think that I'm going to do something really bad. Where are you, Anna? I'm in the parking lot of the apartment where Curtis's girlfriend lives. Her car is here. It's not worth it, Anna. I know, but I can't stand it anymore. Well, come over here. I'm a journalist. I can't be seen at your party headquarters. <laughs> you're not a journalist. You're a disc jockey, but I understand. What were you going to do? Scratch up her car. She'll just make Curtis pay for it. True. Well, I could scream obscenities at her. The complex has a security guard, Anna. Yeah, and he's not sleeping right now, so I guess that is not a good idea. But I need to do something. Well, Anna, tell her boss on Monday. She works with a lawyer. They don't care. Go in, tell the boss, and make sure to say enough that the receptionist knows who you are and can spread it around the office. Curtis would be upset with me, only for a few weeks, and then she will drop him, and that would be that. Why are you so sure? Because the day that you go into that office, Anna, you're going to be looking so good that you can only get sympathy from her co-workers. You did the nails already? Yes. Good. Get the hair done tomorrow, and Monday morning you go over there in white, and make a visual statement that will speak louder than any words and have a lasting impact. Why white? It projects innocence and vulnerability. <laughs> I feel better already, Tati. Well, go home now, baby, and keep your plans to yourself. Don't bother to tell Curtis that you're over there. We will talk more tomorrow. Anna hung up and looked at the little deportee whose paint job had just been saved. It was white and reflected the weakening sun wash before the sodium street lights took over. No, nothing would happen here tonight. The end of the story. For more literary offerings from me, do visit my Google business site where I have short stories and novels and sometimes audio recordings that I've done over time and you can also visit my other website which is uh, Why A Readers Hangout where you also find novels. It's very easy just go look in Google Business and I'm YA author Gwyneth Harold Davidson. See you again another time.